Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Waters, and I work in the FAA's UAS Integration Office. Welcome to the world of aviation. If you are a pilot, you are in the right place. We've assembled an amazing panel to help educate you on the steps you need to take once you unwrap your shiny new drone. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This meeting is being live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you can't stay for the whole program, you can watch a recording of this webinar on the FA's YouTube channel. This is a very short program, so we'll only be answering a few audience questions during the webinar. You can submit your questions in the comments section on YouTube or Facebook and through replies on Twitter. We have staff monitoring these platforms. After the webinar, we will post highlights on our drone event webpage. Now let's meet today's panel. Danielle Corbett is the manager of the Operational Programs Branch in the FAA's Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration Office, where she heads the Partnership for Safety Program, the UAS Support Center, the Test Site Program, the Drone Zone, the UAS, the UAS Collegiate Training Initiative, and other outreach and operational projects. Formerly as an aviation safety inspector, she led project teams on the development and implementation of regulations, policy, and guidance for small UAS. Ken Kranz is the drone and robotics mobility lead for Cognizant Technology Solutions. He business development, technology evangelism, and solution architecture in the unmanned aerial systems sector. Mr. Kranz is also a steering committee member on the FAA's drone safety team, an FAA steering team representative, and an aviation safety reporting system te technical steering committee member. Victoria Gallagher is an airspace expert in the air traffic organization. Some of you may recognize her through her work with Lance. As the Lance program manager, she has overseen the growth of the capability established relationships with industry, and every year led efforts to bring on more FAA UAS service suppliers of Lance. She is passionate about expanding the aviation safety culture to drone pilots. Vern Schertz is a highly experienced remote pilot and remote pilot instructor. He is an adjunct instructor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and the program manager for the trusted operator program at AUVSI. Vern also specializes in the creation of immersive content utilizing photogramming and extended reality technologies. My first question is a lightning round question for all of our panelists. In your experience, what are Newton Flyers the most surprised to learn? Danielle? You broke up there a second. Could you say it one more time, please? <laughs> So sorry about that. My first question is a lightning round question for all the panelists. In your experience, what are new flyers the most surprised to learn? That's a great question. Um, I think that you know, new people are most surprised to learn that the federal government regulates airspace and that includes operation of drones. How about you, Ken? Yeah, it's a similar thing. Um, I think people are very surprised to find out that you just can't take your drone out anytime you want, any way you want and fly. That you do have to put a little bit of research into where you plan on flying to make sure that it's safe and permissible. And um, Victoria? Um, I think one of the surprising things um, I hear is that, you know, drones are considered aircraft. They're not just toys, which is a very common misconception. And um, how about you, Vern? Well, when you're operating a drone, you're actually a pilot. And a lot of people don't realize that they're considered a pilot. And therefore, they're responsible for what they, what they do, where they fly. And, uh, and so there's rules of the road or rules of the sky, so to speak, that they have to adhere to. Thank you. Very interesting. All right, Danielle, you just bought a drone. You opened the box. What do you do first? You read the instructions and get excited <laughs> about flying. Um, but before you fly, you have to register your drone first. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, we have a website, it's called the Drone Zone. 
think you're going to pop up a slide there. There it is. Um, stay tuned because later this week it's going to have a new look and feel. But here's the uh, the drone zone, and this is the official place for you to come to register your drone with the FAA. It takes just a few minutes to do it. It's five dollars, no biggie. Uh, now, to warn you, there are some other companies out there that are offering drone registration services at a, at a premium. Sometimes they will actually complete a legitimate drone registration for you. Sometimes they don't. In any event, they're charging a premium, so be careful with that and come directly to the FAA if you want to be sure you're getting a, a uh, accurate and um, legitimate registration. Um, after that, you want to um, mark the drone. So we'll issue you a registration number. And you take that registration number and you could write it on your drone. You could write it with a marker. You could get a piece of tape and write it on that. You could make a fancy label, do whatever you want, but make sure that uh, you mark your drone with the registration number. And it's really important that you do so. If nothing else, it's for you. If you lose your drone, which a lot of people do, lose them in trees and stuff, um, it's a good way for um, it to be returned back to you. And, um, and then learn how to fly. If you go to our website, faa.gov slant UAS or slash UAS, you'll find some information about the different um, rules and best practices for staying out of trouble and um, making sure you fly safely and don't harm your drone or anyone. Um, so that's, those are the first things. Most of all, you know, go out there once you're ready and have fun. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Fern, not everyone realizes that buying a drone makes you a pilot. Talk to us about the trust as a training tool for recreational flyers. What is it? Does everyone have to take it? So uh, back in the summer of uh, uh, 2021, the FAA worked with uh, other training partners to develop and administer a, uh, uh, an aeronautical knowledge and safety test for all recreational flyers. Uh, this test is free of charge. You can take it as many times as you need to in order to pass it. And it is required uh, by law. And once you do pass your test and you have your certificate, uh, you need to keep it with you at all times in case law enforcement or uh, any official from the FAA you know, asks you to see it. Uh, it's an excellent uh, way to learn the rules of the sky and to um, uh, you know, enhance your education and training uh, about flying. The, uh, more information can be found on the, uh, the FAA's uh, website. And also there's a list of all the different uh, organizations that administer this exam. Thanks, that's a, that's a great uh, point you made about taking trust. And um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about trust, our team just did a webinar with more details on the importance of learning the rules and taking trust, which you can watch on this very same YouTube channel. So check that out. Victoria? Now I'm registered, marked, and have basic drone knowledge. What do I do next? That is a really important question, Rebecca. And uh, what's important to remember is that the FAA manages all of the airspace uh, all across our nation. And it was surprising for me to learn when, when I first joined the world of, of aviation that FAA even is responsible for airspace in our own backyard. So the most important thing to remember for drone pilots is that we essentially have two categories of airspace, controlled and uncontrolled. Controlled airspace is defined as airspace where FAA provides air traffic services. And the easiest way to think of it is airspace that surrounds airports. In controlled airspace, you are required to have an approval from the FAA to fly prior to your flight. Luckily, over the last couple of years, we've implemented processes that can make this really easy and in your real time. You can do that by using apps provided by FAA approved UAS service suppliers of low altitude authorization and notification capability, as we know it in this community as LANS. You can find the list of suppliers on our website, faa.gov slash go slash LANS, we currently have 15 FAA approved service suppliers. So I encourage everyone to check it out and pick out products that best suit your needs. Um, and all of those applications provide recreational flyers with near real time airspace authorization. Um, we do recommend that you, uh, you can uh, fire your flight as soon as 
possible, you can request airspace authorization up to 90 days in advance. So even though it's an, in your real time, you can get an approval, you can also plan it out for, for uh, days or weeks or even months in advance of your operation. Lance applications also provide with general awareness on airspace restrictions and regulations and link to all the FAA resources that you need to operate safely. Basically, everything you need to learn and know are contained in those applications. And now in uncontrolled airspace, you don't need an airspace authorization prior to your operation. However, you must never fly above 400 feet. Buying a drone is really an exciting time. And as soon as you do buy one, you become a part of a really unique and supportive community of aviators who share a joint responsibility for keeping our airspace safe. So um, that is the most important thing to know. Um, it's, all, it's also worth mentioning that um, we also have an FAA app specifically for rec flyers. And that app is called Before You Fly. And that's the letter B, the number four, and the letters U, F, L, Y. And it provides you with the same level of situational awareness about airspace as Lance, but it's not part of Lance and you can't apply for airspace authorizations through it. All right, before every flight, you need to make a plan. Ken, besides FAA requirements, what are some ways I can practice good drone etiquette? Well, in general, um, it was already stated that you can't fly over 400 feet. And in theory, the FAA owns the, the airspace from the grass up. So um, obviously, good etiquette is to stay below the 400 feet. That's a regulation. But also, if you're flying in your neighborhood, that you respect people around you. Um, the rules say you can't fly over people. So um, it doesn't mean you can't be flying over your neighbor's houses and stuff, but don't fly over you know, individuals or groups of people and, you know, keep your drone at a sufficient altitude that it doesn't become kind of annoying for the people in your immediate vicinity. So basically be a good neighbor and um, make sure that uh, people in your community have a good of uh, drone flyers. All right. Yeah, I guess one way to think of that is if you were sitting in your backyard and somebody else was flying a drone, uh, you know, and they were just 10 feet off, their, off your backyard, you would kind of find that annoying. So don't be that person. <laughs> gotcha. All right, let's see if we have any um, audience questions. Um, I don't see any. Do we have um, anything else that the panelists would like to... Um, expand upon any of their answers? Looks like Vern has one. Um, yeah, getting back to best practices and, and drone etiquette. One thing that a lot of uh, new flyers don't realize is there are also state laws governing where you can operate drones from, as well as, as uh, local ordinances, whether that's you know county ordinances or if you live in a, a, a town or a city, that municipality. So it's always a good thing to, to look up your state. What are the drone laws associated with your state? Where can you fly? Where can you not fly? For example, don't fly around or over prisons or jails. That's the quickest way to get yourself in trouble. Um, so, so check those out. Um, check the local ordinances. Some parks allow you to fly. Uh, some don't. And by knowing the laws, uh, that helps you if you have any interactions with, with bystanders that are coming by, wondering whether you can or can't fly in that area, as well as law enforcement when they come up. Knowing all the, the, the laws and ordinances in your area is, is a very, very, um, uh, it, it's a good to know thing. All right, thank you, Vern, good point. Uh, looks like we do have a question from the audience and it says, as a drone pilot, What's one activity you could recommend for a new flyer to become a better pilot? Oh, oh go ahead, Ken. Okay. Oh, uh, I was going to say, I was going to call on you, Daniel. Go ahead. Uh, and if we're uh, we'll, we'll call on Ken. I see the floor. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to really understand how it works. Um, so read up on your drone, learn how the apps work, learn what its functions are and how to get out of trouble. 
Um, there's so much information, you know, of course you have to be careful when you Google something or put something, I shouldn't have said that, but put something <laughs> like on the internet, um, but get to know like literally how it works. These are re really sophisticated pieces of equipment at times. Um, and there's a lot of features in there to help keep you out of trouble, but there's a lot of features in there that can help you get into trouble. Um, so I would do that. I would practice. I'd find a safe place um, to practice, a nice open field. And just remember that there's a lot of obstacles out there, um, you know, and things that you might not think of, like high wind or power line, um, you know, let alone there's aircraft and other drones flying around and things like that. But um, just like everything else, like I tell my children, practice, 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 and that's how we improve our skills. All right. Thank you, I'd Daniel. Like to, I'd like to add on to that. And if you don't like to read, <laughs> join a local community organization like the AMA and go to a flying field. And there will be people there with tons of experience with drones and fixed wing radio control aircraft. And they will show you everything that you need to know. And you never have to read anything in that case. They will just teach it to you and, and spoon feed it. And regardless, you should join an AMA club and you just learn so many good things and pick up on tips that you wouldn't, well, that not that you wouldn't think of, but you'll learn the hard way at the, probably the cost of your drone. All right. Thanks, Ken. I know I have one of those right close to my house. Um, we have another question. What are some other ways new drone pilots can learn about safety rules? Uh, Victoria, do you have an answer for this one? Sure, I think we touched on it a little bit. Um, there are certainly ways to join communities. AMA is a great example. Um, FAA.gov uh, slash UAS has a ton of resources to get you started um, on how to register and learn um, all the federal regulations around what you should and should not be doing. All right. Great. Thank you, Victoria. Danielle, did you have anything else or? I did. Thank you for noticing. Okay. Uh, one thing, you know, sometimes there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of good information out there, a lot of bad information out there. And the information on the, our website is great. Sometimes it's hard to understand or you may have some questions. We do have a support center, um, an FAA support center. We have some people who work there. They answer phone calls and emails all day. You talk to an actual person and you can call and say, hey, I live like right here and drop a pin and say, you know, what's the airspace around me? What do I need to know? And they'll help walk you through it. Um, they'll help you with simple questions. They'll help you with complex questions. If you want to start delivering pizzas with your drone, <laughs> call us. Um, it's 844-FLY-MY-UA um, or UAS help at FAA.gov. Um, if you didn't write that down, that's all on our website as well um, and on the drone zone. So check it out. Thanks for mentioning that, Danielle. Um, the people that work in the support center are very helpful. All right, I have another question. I'm flying my drone for fun in my backyard. Do I really need to register it and get permission to fly? Go ahead, Vern. Um, yes, you have to, well, unless it's under uh, 250 grams, you don't have to register your drone. But if it's uh, heavier than two, or it's 250 grams or heavier, uh, but less than you know 55 pounds, then yes, you have to register that drone. Um, and as far as uh, permission to fly, again, a lot of that depends on where you are. Uh, you know whether you know there's any uh, state or uh, ordinances or state laws that are prohibiting you from flying there. And one more thing, if you're flying on private property that's not yours. Uh, make sure you get the owner's permission first before you fly and operate from that property. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Um, I guess we kind of touched on this one earlier when I was waiting for questions to come in. Um, but this question says, what about state and local laws for flying drones? So I guess um, Vern and Ken kind of touched on this. Do you have any follow up? Um, yeah. Just about every county and uh, municipality, you can look up ordinances. So if you look up the the the, the name of the uh, the town you're in and the state, and you know with the keyword ordinances, it'll come up. And usually it's in the uh, parks and recreations area. Sometimes they have it grouped in under an area called aviation. Um, and so that's where you, if you're going to find any restrictions on where you can or can't uh, operate. Uh, a drone. So that's one way to check out, as well as the state laws. You can, you can look those up online. 
And I could add to that too. As a general rule, if you live within about five miles of an airport or close to any kind of state park or federal park or a preserve, you know, right off the bat, that should ring bells in your head that, you know, you need to check that out. That's not a guarantee if you're not in those areas that there aren't some other rules or, you know, county rules, but those definitely should pop into your mind very quickly. And, and one more thing, when it comes to flying in uh, state parks or municipal parks, or even in national parks, there are ways that you can apply for and get a permit and be allowed to fly legally within those areas. So just because it says you can't fly there, there are permitting um, the ways of getting permits so that you can. All right. Thanks for letting us know about that. All right, we have one more question. It says, you all mentioned apps earlier. What are some FAA apps drone pilots can use to help them fly safely? So I had mentioned the Before You Fly app and I have that app on my phone. It's really easy to use. And um, I know we talked about uh, the Lance apps. Um, did you want to talk any more about that, Danielle and Victoria? Sure, I can talk a little bit more about Lance applications. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there's a whole list of the uh, FAA approved UAS service suppliers. There are drone companies who we've teamed up with over the years to provide UAS services to the community. Um, if you go on, the, on our website, there will be a list of 15 companies indicating which ones do provide services com for commercial operators as well as recreational flyers. Uh, from there, you can link right to the company's name and look them up either in the App Store or Google Store. Um, many of them have desk desktop applications. So it's really your preference on how you would like to uh, work the application and what suits your needs the best. So um, there's a variety of products and I encourage everyone to go check it out, play, play with them and figure out what works best for you. All right, great. Thank you, Victor. Anything to add, Danielle? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that'll definitely, um, those apps are, will help you uh, figure out the airspace and um, flight restrictions and things like that. If you're talking about apps to fly safely, I mean, most drones come with some sort of you know, software with it. There's other things that you can buy in the market. It's kind of like out of our area of expertise. But um, if you're interested, I mean, there's all kinds of things out there to help you, whether you're into drone racing or photography or whatever your particular um, interest is. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff out there on the market to help you fly safely and do cool stuff um, and help help your proficiency. There's so many things you can do with drones. I always call the fun stuff. Um, we have another question. If you are a Part 107 pilot, do you have to register your drone? And I know the answer to that. The answer is yes. And um, I, I would also say, um, it looks like Fern wanted to answer this question. I would argue that as a 107 pilot, you register each of your drones, but as a recreational pilot, you just have one registration for as many drones you own. That one number applies to all your drones. Did I get that right, Vern? Um, actually, I believe uh, you have to register each one of your drones. Um, I'm not, well, I'm not sure about the recreational side. I always fly part 107 commercially. So that that's something um, I'll, I, I'll have to look at look at because I register all my drones, even the ones that are less than 250 grams. I go ahead and register them anyways. Um, recreation, so, you only need one registration, but okay. but I yeah, do right. something similar. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, now, as far as uh, if you have a part 107, if you're always flying commercially and you're not flying recreationally, um, I don't think you have to take trust, but uh, I would go ahead and do that anyways. Uh, oh, did you see our next question, Vern? Our next question was, if you're a 107 pilot, do you have to take the trust? So, so I'll go uh, ahead and let you uh, repeat that answer. I, I would certainly think, uh, you know, it would, be, it would behoove you to go ahead and take that. Um, and I mean, you can never have enough certifications, right? right? If I could add on to that. Yeah, I, I'm of the same mentality. Um, you don't have to take it if you're a commercial operator. It doesn't hurt to take it. And if there's ever any questions, it always looks better, you know, for your clients, right? When they go to hire you that you've taken <clears throat> trust test. There's also TOPS, right? Which you could take was the trusted operator program, which has three levels. And that's another thing that can help distinguish you from other drone operators to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm top three certified and the other person you look at isn't, right? So it doesn't hurt to do that. 
And even separate from training, there is the ASRS, right? So if you see something like the way software works or a certain drone works, like, like it was said earlier, you're an active member of the national airspace now. So if you see something that you think not only was a problem for you personally, but it's probably a problem for other drone operators out there, the ASRS is out there. So you can report it and say, hey, you know, I was using this brand drone and this software. And when you press the button in this circumstance, it does something wrong. Right. And that way you get that information out and and the FAA can then turn around and go back to manufacturers and say, hey, fix this problem. Right. We don't want the airspace messed up. So get many certifications, take many classes. It doesn't hurt. So it sounds our education is is better. The more you know, well, the, the more fun you have flying. Yeah. So, well, Danielle, speaking, if a, go ahead, Vern. Well, real quick, I was going to say, uh, speaking of the trusted operator program, um, it's an excellent way of expanding your knowledge well beyond what you would get with just a part 107. And if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm the, as, as you, the intro said, I'm the uh, program manager for TOP at uh, AUVSI, which is also an excellent resource for information and knowledge to do with everything uh, autonomous and, and uncrewed and a uh, great place to learn things. Great, thanks, Vern. I would just like uh, to Danielle, this question. Oh, go ahead, Victoria. We have a lot to say about this education. Yes, piece. yes, this is a great <laughs> topic. It really is important, but equally as important to note that if you're operating as a recreational flyer, but now you decide that you know you want to go take some pictures for your neighbors who are putting their house up for sale, or um, you're doing some photography on the side and selling your images, you are moving towards part 107 operations and it is required that you um, obtain the proper certification to do that so that's the only words of caution um, i wanted to add right i got you so uh, more education is better and if you're flying for fun make sure that you're just flying for fun and not any sort of business uh going on with that uh, recreational drone and and your flight all right danielle this next question is for you. If a law enforcement office, if a law enforcement officer approaches you when you are flying, what paperwork can they ask to see? Ooh. Um, well, if you're a recreational flyer, you are required to show them your registration. So you can have that uh, on a piece of paper. You can have that on your phone, but make sure you have a copy of your registration handy. Um, and I, yep, go ahead, Ken. <laughs> No, I thought you were done. Sorry, I didn't need to stop on you. You want to finish? Um, also, ID um, and identification, government identification of yourself. Um, you may be asked for um, other documents, but you can supply those later, such as you know your Part 107 certificate or any waivers or documents, airspace authorizations that you have. What about um, proof that you've taken the trust? Do you are law enforcement officers allowed to ask for that? Oh, Rebecca, <laughs> I believe that uh, the statute does require you to show proof of completion of the trust. And again, um, you can have that on your phone. You just saw my home screen there. Um, you can have that on paper. Um, but yeah, completion of the trust test as well. Thank and you. the only reason that I need to ask you that, Danielle, is because I watched our webinar last week about the trust. So um, once again, if anybody's interested in more information, you can go back and watch that webinar on um, faa.gov uh, slash UAS slash events, I think. And so can um, I add something real quick onto that last answer? Um, sure. So the ID has to be a photo ID, by the way. But the, the thing I wanted to really answer is attitude. It's all about attitude. Um, if you go on the internet, you'll see so many YouTube videos, of people who are going to tell the police off or tell them what the, the business is. Don't do that. Land the drone, have a decent conversation. You'll find, especially nowadays, they're very receptive to what's, what's going on in the drone industry and just be a good neighbor. Yeah, I Absolutely. can tack onto that. that um, sorry, <laughs> keep stepping all over each other. Um, you know, you're now part of a community, the aviation community, and we talk a lot about safety culture in the, in the aviation community. And so, yeah, you might be annoyed that the police officer is asking you a question when you're doing nothing wrong. 
Um, but you're representing all of the drone fires at that point. And we're still like, you know, even drones have been around for a while. We're still on this, you know, cusp of um, people really understanding what they are, what they're doing. And, you know, some people are nervous by them. And, you know, so I think being a good um, ambassador for the industry itself is a good thing to keep in mind. You don't want to be the one who ruins it for the team kind of thing. Um, and if you're a good neighbor, um, it's, it's really best for the entire aviation community. So I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Have that good drone etiquette when you're flying for fun. All right. Yeah, again, um, looks like you know, Vern has one more thing. Again, knowing knowing the the local and municipal, county, and state laws and uh, ordinances, if you know what all those are, if you're ever confronted by somebody, uh, even even sometimes law enforcement doesn't necessarily know what all the laws and ordinances are. But having that knowledge gives you a better ability to, to speak to somebody about you know, what you can and can't do with drones uh, and turn it into uh, more of a, a learning engagement with somebody. Uh, but you never, you never want to get confrontational. And if somebody decides they want to be confrontational, the best thing you can do is say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and leave and you pack your stuff up and you go. Yeah, I, I second that. Sometimes the... The better part of valor is just to retreat, right? If the officer doesn't know the law, you can try to explain it, but your job is not to make it stick. Um, sometimes you just have to pack it up. There's pictures of me being questioned by two federal agents and a police department helicopter circling our mission. And you know, our attitude was we showed them the paperwork and we said, we're willing to shut this down right now until you guys verify everything. And they just looked at our paperwork and said, nope, you're good. Go back to work. So, you know, just be nice. Again, be a good neighbor. So good attitude and good etiquette is important to make sure that you keep your flying fun. All right. Thank you, everyone. This has been a great discussion. I want to thank all of our panelists and for a great presentation and um, for sharing your experiences and insight. Today's discussion is part of our Flying for Fun summer webinar series. Please join us on August 24th for Welcome to the Friendly Skies. For more information, check out our website at faa.gov slash UAS slash events. Thanks.